not be the whole thing, but we are in the book of James, and we're in three knots on a dead log, and I know that's a little cutie pie title, um, but, but it, really, it really does reflect what uh, the first part, at least the first part of chapter 4 of the book of James is about. It's about a church being evaluated, and when, you read, when we read it, and in just a moment we'll read like the first couple of three verses, you'll, you'll remember what we were in last week and what we were talking about, about a church that's being described by James as if he has analyzed this church. And after analyzing this church, he's watched how they operate. He's heard their prayers. He's been in their committee meetings. He's been to a deacon's meeting or two. He's talked to the pastor in his office. He's, he's, he's visited with the church secretary and, and, and the Sunday school teachers and the nursery workers and, and the youth ministers. And he's evaluated all the different sections of some church somewhere which we really don't know what church. It might be the church he pastors, or it could be the one next door. We, we really don't know what church, but we do know that he is talking to a church that he has evaluated, and he's reporting, his, he's reporting all right, now I've done all this evaluation. Let me tell you what I see. Yeah. And so James then, after telling them, after evaluation, he says, here's what I see. Verse 1, where do wars and fights come from among you? All right, so we have a church that is warring and fighting. Now, I know you've probably never been in a church that has warred and fought against each other. You've never been in a church where you have splits, where you have factions in the church. You have one faction that wants to lead this way and another faction that wants to go that way. Churches that have cliques in them where... You, you know you don't fit into the clique, and the clique is always making decisions about things and has way more influence with the pastor and the leaders of the church than you seemingly have. And a church that's divided, the church that's split, a church that is a, that's an insult to God is really what it boils down. Where do, where do these fights and wars, it sounds like an interesting church. Wouldn't you love to be in some of their business meetings? You know, where do these fights... I mean, this is a church, this is a Christian church being described as fighting and warring with each other. Good night. You know, them's, them's battle words, right? <laughs> them's battle words, right? <laughs> Holy some ghost. Where do fights and wars come? What a way to start a report. The first words out of the report is, where do these fights and wars come from among you? And then he says, well, to me, uh, uh, they come from the desires for pleasure that war in your members. In other words, you, got, you guys got people in your church that want certain things. They're, they're, they like certain directions. They like certain things. They like certain um, activities. They, they really love to be this way, and they love that. And so they're fighting for what they like, and others are fighting for what they like, and others are fighting what they like. Nobody's fighting for what God likes, is, is the point I think James is making. God is, is kicked out the back door, and we have a church that fights within itself because uh, they only care about themselves. And then he goes on to say, okay, you lust and you do not have, in verse 2, Listen to the words that are describing the way this church lives its life. You lust and you and you and you and you don't have. You murder. Oh my goodness, they're murder, murdering in the church. Whoo, man, what an indictment there, right? Yeah. Now I don't think that means that they take out a knife and stab each other, or they probably take out a weapon and kill each other. It could mean that, but I, I doubt whether it means that. It probably means you murder people's reputation. You murder people's lives. You backbite and you snipe and you gossip and you, and you create a, a death for other people by what you say about them. You know, you, you're always down on somebody. You're implying things. You might not even say it out loud, but you don't have to talk about somebody. You just have to not defend somebody. Did, and use little phrases like, did you hear? Oh, my goodness, this could not be true, could it? We need to pray for so-and-so because I heard so-and-so. I mean, yeah, murdering people's reputation, murdering people's uh, anointing, murdering people's yeah. lives, murdering people's ability to minister in the name of Christ. You know, it's so amazing. I have been a pastor for 43 years. 
It's a lot of years, right? And I know you're surprised because I look so young. But, but I, I, you know, I know these people that are on the Internet, they're going, oh, my goodness, man, you couldn't have pastored that. You were in the cradle, right? Um, I know I look like about 21, but I'm, I'm a little older than that. But, but anyway, I have actually, listen, I have actually experienced this that I'm about to say to you. Uh, I've pastored eight churches over my 43 years, so I'm, I've been in them uh, a long time. I've pastored 10 years here, 14 years here. You know, I mean, a long time, nine years here. You know, we've been Freedom River Church for 10 years. We're yeah. starting our 10th year. Everybody said they'll never make it. Everybody said, well, you know, be careful because they'll get hurt you, you know. And here we are 10 years later, and, and, and God's blessing and God's working and, you know, all of that. And, and so, but I've been in, I've been, I've pastored churches before that I, honestly, my ability to really help somebody has been greatly hindered because they have been having barbecued pastor for the last five years for their lunch on Sunday. You know, our pastor didn't do this, didn't do that. He said this, he should have done that. He doesn't like us, blah, blah, whatever it might be. I get barbecued and roasted at their meal, Sunday meal every Sunday, and their children sit there and hear it. And so do their children respect me? No, not at all. Their children think I'm what their parents are saying there. And then along comes drug addiction, and along comes uh, sexual problems, and along comes deviancy, and along comes uh, uh, problems, you know, with their self-image and self-respect. And it's their pastor that God could use to help them. I'm the very one that would need to speak to them and counsel them and push them forward from their issue of life. But now my ability to do that has been destroyed because they have, over the years, had barbecued preacher. And now this person has no respect for the very one that could be used by God to lift them out of that weakness of life. You see what I'm saying? This is, I think, what he means by you murder and you covet and you lust and you desire to have and, and you fight and you war, yet you have not because you ask not. And you ask and you don't receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your, on your pleasures. Uh, this is a terrible thing. You know, this bunch just can't win, can they? I mean, think about it. It's bad to have not. How would you like for your life to be described by what you don't have? How would your like to life uh, like to be described, hey, have you met my husband? Yeah, uh, man, he doesn't have any peace in his life. He never smiles. He has no anointing in his life. He can't pray. My goodness, I mean, I wish I had a man that could lead me, and, and he's not a leader. He's not a prayer. He's not a generous person. He's not joyful. I mean, I wish my husband was joyful. I wish my wife was, uh, was happy, and they're not. But you see what I mean. I mean, it, it's bad to be described by what you don't have. It's bad. James says that, that you are a possessionless people. You're, you're described, your church is described by what it doesn't have rather than what it does have. And whether or not you know this, this is an indictment. This is an indictment against God because the Scripture says that, you know, we're, given, we're empowered by God. We're given things by God. We're given anointings. We're given abilities. We're given gifts. We're given, we're given a peace in our life because we endure hardships, and this peace perfects us, which that might be an, an, a, a, an interesting concept, but it just boils down to this that a lot of times things don't happen like we think they should in our life because God opens a door so that you will have to trust him and, and experience him so that he can use that situation to strengthen that weak area of your life. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that challenge from God has a perfecting. It moves you t a little closer toward perfection. Look at your neighbor and say, not like I'm going to get there. I'm not preaching to you that you're going to ever arrive at perfection. This side of Jesus coming. Yeah, when Jesus comes, he'll make us perfect. But until he comes, we're always battling against, against an enemy that's trying to, to, to tear us down. And, 
And, but we should be moving toward that, per, that perfection. That, that should be my goal. That should be what I'm striving for. If you said, Pastor, what, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> yeah. I would say, well, I want to be full of peace. I want my life to be peaceful, uh, love, joy, long-suffering. I want to be a gentle person. I would like to be known as a gentleman. I would like for people to look at my life as, as being related to the, to the gentleness of a loving Savior. Yeah. Savior. Yeah. Goodness. I want to be a good man. I want to do good things. I want people to know that when I do something, that it's going to be good for them, that my best, their best interest, that, I, that's what I want to be. Faith. I want to be a person of faith. Mm-hmm. By the way, if you're, unless you, you know, you probably know what I'm, the list I'm going down is Galatians uh, 5, where he talks about the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. I'm just going down the list, and I'm just saying that that's what God is doing in our life. He is, he is growing us. He is perfecting us. So that's, that, that's what I want. And so, uh, you know, to have not is an indictment. The Holy Spirit says we have peace We have joy, we have strength, we have passion, we have comfort, we have security, we have, we're we're gifted with all these things, we're endued with power, you know, when he told the disciples, go to Jerusalem and tarry until you be endued with power from on high. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and you're going to have strength that you never used to have in life. But if you look at church nowadays, we don't have power. We don't have strength. We don't have glory. We don't have peace. Why? We're a bunch of have-nots. And that's an indictment against God. Now, I know this is negative, and I know I'm, I don't, I'm not usually negative, but I'm just going with what James is saying here. That's what he's saying. This bunch just have not. And then they ask and they don't even get it when they ask for it. I mean, it's bad to have not. It's worse to ask not, even though you don't, have, you don't ask. And, and, and worse or still, more worse or <laughs> more worse or still, uh, even when you do ask, you don't get. I mean, what? The frustration of that, think about it. And so James says, all right, you're three knots on a dead log. You have not, you ask not, and you receive not. There you go. That means you're not walking in life, but you're walking, you're, you're, you're waddling in death, spiritual death, you know, uh, mediocrity, uh, confusion, frustration. You're walking not under the anointing, but you're walking under... Uh, a performance menu or whatever it might be, and you're getting more and more frustrated, more and more depressed, more and more anxious in life because of, uh, of that lack of performance. And so you're fighting and you're warring and you're trying to have, but you can't obtain. And you don't have because you don't ask. It's simple monotonous. Hey, man, have you ever thought about asking God instead of fighting for it? Why don't you ask God for it? Instead of warring against each other, why don't you ask God for it? And so that's the, that's the key here. And so I've given you one little fill-in point on the outline. I've suggested to you four symptoms. You say, is God talking about me in these verses? Is that my life? Well, here we go. I have four things, and I promise you I'm going to try to get through them. I've already done this one. I'm not re-preaching. Number one, my, all right, this is me. If my life can be described by what I am not rather than by what I am. That is a symptom that I'm muddling through life, not being drawn by the Spirit of God. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not what I should be, all right? Um, and I'm going to, these are all passages I read last week to you showing you that we're to have peace, we're to have power, we're to have strength, and so forth. Here's the second, here's the second issue, the second symptom. Uh, I, I'm a knot on a dead log. Uh, if God is my last choice rather than my first. When things happen in your life, do you go to God with it first, or is he the last, uh, is he the, is he the last thought in the, in the, in the issue? When things, when things aren't right, when things are in distress and things are, are not what they should be, um, 
is he on the top of your list or is he your last resort? When things happen, do you go to him first automatically or is he just, uh, you know, some kind of extension on the end of everything after you've tried everything? He's like a little sign up there. After you've tried everything, uh, uh, break the glass. It's God, you know. <laughs> He's here. If he's your last resort rather than your first choice, then the Bible says, and James is saying here, uh, that's a symptom that, that you have some real issues of life and death. No, notice uh, in, in verses 1 and 2, uh, it's really a very frustrating way that, that James talks about these people. Uh, where do wars and fightings come from, come from among you? Do they not come from your desires at pleasure? Uh, uh, for desire that, ple that uh, pleasure, that war in your members, you lust, you don't have, you murder and covet, and you cannot obtain, you fight and you war, yet you have not because you ask not. I mean, it's a frustrating description here because it's, it's one thing not to have any desires, right? I mean, it, it, that would be an issue of life if you didn't desire anything. But if you didn't desire anything, the fact that you don't have it would not really be frustrating because you don't even desire it. But this verse says that these people were not like that, that these people did have some desires. You knew where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires? So they do have desires for pleasure. You lust and you don't have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you have not. In other words, they do want some stuff. So uh, because uh, if, you, if you don't have anything and you don't want anything, there's no frustration and depression about not having anything, right? right, right. But if you do want some stuff and you do desire some stuff and you cannot obtain that, then you're going to continually become more and more frustrated in life, right? You're going to get more and more annoyed and aggravated and frustrated, and most likely you're going to get more and more depressed in life. So one of the signs of frustration, and hear me when I say this, one of the signs of frustrations is when you have lost your way, when you, when, 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 you are, when you are not sensing that you're getting what you're desiring, the first thing you begin to do in your frustration and depression is you begin to redouble your efforts. In other words, you begin to, to work harder and harder to try to get what it is that, 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 that you're not getting that way. You're, you're, you're working long. You're working hard. You're, you keep trying to obtain it, and it doesn't seem like it's getting any closer. I mean, it'd be because I'm used to church stuff, and I'm used to the way churches operate. It would be like, all right, uh, this church is not receiving what God is wanting us to have, and so we want certain stuff, and we've been battling with each other, and we've been trying to uh, downgrade somebody. We've been trying to get what they have. We've been trying to take things away from them. We've been trying to lead in an opposite direction. I mean, we're fighting and we're warring and we're killing each other because we're frustrated about the fact that we don't have what we need to have and we really want that, but we can't get that. And, and, and so, and so we, we form a committee. Yeah, we form a committee. And we charge this committee with, a, with, all right, we want you to get together and we want you to have a committee meeting and you pray about it and you ask God about it and we want you to tell us uh, how we can have what it is we're desiring. So the committee gets together and they have a meeting and they have a discussion and they have votes in the committee and the committee comes back and says, hey, listen, here's why we don't have what we, what we need. We need a new pastor. That's what we need. We've studied the results. We've studied the controversy. And I'm going to tell you what. You know what we need? We need us a new pastor, baby. If we had a new pastor, woo, we could go in the right direction. Or if it wasn't the pastor, we need, some, we need a new staff. I mean, our staff is not doing their job. It might be an education minister or a teacher or, or, the, or the nursery department or the youth person or whatever. And, and, and man, if we had that, boy, we would, we, would, we would have what we need. And so we need people that will work harder and work longer and be more dedicated. 
Or if it's not the pastor and it's not some other staff member, I mean, it could be we, if we had a, a more interesting uh, church plant, like our buildings were bigger and our nursery was shinier and our, and our classrooms were bigger and more elaborate, man, we could really have what we want if we just had that. And what I'm saying to you is one of the signs that we have an issue is when you don't have, you get frustrated and try to figure out what it is you could do to have what you need. And James says, you know what your problem is? You're getting more and more frustrated and more and more depressed and more and more annoyed because you keep trying to have things by figuring out what, you, what more you need to do. Let's double our effort. Let's double our commitment. Let's double our time. Let's get more involved. Let's have more meetings. Let's have revivals. Let's have all of these things so we can get what we need in life. And James comes back and says, when are you going to grow up and understand? You know why you don't have? Because you don't ask God. God is on the last page of your life. And you try new budgets and new pastors and new churches and new menus and new people and new scribes and new books and new uh, formats and everything. You try everything in your life but God. And James says, try, get with God first and you'll, and you'll begin to have those things. You have not because you don't ask God. And I'm just saying. If God is your last choice rather than your first choice, that means you've got a problem. Just like James says, you're not on a dead log. Look at your neighbor and say, I hope he's not talking about you. <laughs> I know he's not talking about me, so he's got to be talking to somebody up there. Let's look at another. Here's another symptom. You ready for this one? Number three, I'm not on a dead log if I'm more concerned about my own exaltation rather than exalting God. To lift up God, to, to uh, glorify him. In other words, I'm a not on a dead log if I'm more interested in uh, what I need uh, making me the star, making me the big shot, rather than thinking about God at all. In other words, I want to be, I'm praying for revival, not for re revival's sake. I'm praying for gifts, not for, not for God's sake. I'm praying for anointing, not because God could be exalted in my life more. I'm praying for the, the filling of the Holy Spirit, not because I could be greater used by God. I'm praying for the filling, but what I'm really wanting is the feeling of the Holy Spirit so I can be the star, so people will look at me, so that people will say, wow, there's a really anointed, wonderful, great person in life, so I can lay hands on somebody and they'll fall out at the altar or they'll start speaking in tongues or whatever it is that I feel like they need to do and you guys feel like they need to do because we're not interested in God being exalted. We're interested in being the star of the show ourselves. So people will admire and respect us. I mean, to heck with God. Who cares about that? The fact is, we need to fill up a building, man. We need to get more offering. We need to be more respected in the city. We need to have people clamoring at our door saying, let us in, let us in. And we, have to, and we can be exclusive about who we allow in because we have all these people wanting in because we can do all of this magical, mystical stuff that other people can't do. What a charade. What a farce. What an insult to God. James says, look, in verse 3, no, no, notice what he says. Uh, you have not because you ask not, verse 3, you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you might, you might spend it on your pleasures. I mean, it's sad enough not to have. It's worse not to want. And it's, like I said, worse or still when you do ask, you, uh, you don't get what you ask for. So the report comes back. Remember, James is making this report. So the report comes back. You don't have, and the reason you don't have is because you don't ask. 
And so the church says, all right, then we're going to start asking. All right, so let's form a committee. Because this com- we, and, and we're going to give this committee the charge. Here's the charge. Um, your charge is to start asking God for all these things. And so the committee says, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to form prayer committees. And we're going to form uh, prayer groups. And we're going to get the prayer chain started. Like one call the other and the other. And we're going to get this prayer chain and prayer group. And we're going to call together some, some intercessors. We're going to call people who are professional prayers. People who can intercede with the Spirit of God. And we're going to call them and we're going to say, Hey, man, we want to be plugged into God. Get us plugged into God. And we're going to get our prayer groups going. And they're going to be crying out to God. And we're going to get our prayer chains chaining. And they're going to be calling out to God. And we're going to get our intercessors praying. And then we're going to get plugged into God. And when that happens, we're going to have everything we need. And then the monotonous answer from God comes back. Even when you do ask, you're not going to get what you're asking for. Because your heart's all out of whack. Because you are asking for your sake, not for God's sake. You're not asking to be a greater church because you want to lift God. You want to exalt the Spirit of God. You want people to love God. You want to be a bigger church and fancier so that everybody can pat you on the back and admire you and love you and want to be touched by you and ask your opinion about everything and and read your book. What's wrong? Your prayers are totally selfish. That's what's wrong. And James says, so if if that's the way you're going to be, God's not going to even give you what you ask for. You know why? Because God is not in the business of satisfying the carnal request of people for power, for influence, for wealth. God is not going to feed your carnal worldly appetites. He's not in the business of glorifying you. He's in the business of doing things that, that through you glorify him. That's what he's all about. And, and when you ask for that, which would, would help you be able to manifest him, which would exalt him, which would be something that would draw people to him. You know, you know, you know why this world doesn't love God? Because they don't know God. If this world could see God, they would love God. But they can't see God. You know why? Because we don't manifest God. We manifest ourselves. We manifest the fact that we do good things because we're good people. We do nice things because we're nice people. We build buildings and we give millions of dollars and we tell the world, oh, it was God that gave us all that stuff. But all they see is a bunch of upper middle class people with some money that spend a million dollars building a nice building. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, it's a beautiful church. But they don't look at that and say, that's a gift from God. And all I'm saying is that if we will reflect God, this world will see God And this world will love God if they can see God. And the only way they get to see God is through us. And so James says, you know, here's our problem. We're not reflecting God. And we don't have because we don't ask. And even when we do ask, we don't get because we're not not using it to honor God. We're selfish and carnal and full of ourselves. And so don't think God's going to answer that. Because he doesn't answer your desire for power and glory and fame. God answers prayers so it can reflect his image and his greatness and his glory to this world. So James is a great church analyst, right? Look at that. One more thing. This is is the fourth thing. And then next week we're going to get on what are you going to do about it? I mean, he not only tells them what's wrong in the next five or six verses. He says, okay, here's what you do about it. If this is you, this is what you need to do. In the next, we're going to have about eight things next week, or however many I can get to. That'll say, that'll say, okay, here's your problem. All right, let's get this one, this last one that says, you got a problem. Here it is. All right, I'm a knot on a dead log. If I'm not careful, 
if I'm not careful to protect my fellowship with God. Now, I chose this word fellowship uh, on purpose now, and I'm going to give you just a thought theologically. I did not say that we are not careful to protect our relationship. There's a difference between relationship and fellowship. To be related means that you and I are linked by genetics, by blood. Uh, We are bonded together that we are related to each other. You're adopted, I'm adopted. We are related. You were born by natural blood. I'm born by natural blood by the same mama or the same daddy or the same mama and daddy. Then we are related to each other. When you are related to someone, no matter what they do, you are still related to them, right? I'm, I, have a, I have a brother and two sisters myself that I'm related to. If my brother and two sisters rob a bank and, and go to prison, even though they're in prison and I'm in the pulpit, I'm still related to them because our relation is there regardless of what happens on the outside. However, our fellowship is related to what happens in our life. Like, I still am related, but our fellowship is now broken because they are in prison and I'm on the outside. So our fellowship has been affected, but our relationship is still there, whether I want it to be or not. I could try to disown them and try to say, no, I reject them as my blood kin. But no matter what I do, I'm still related to them. But my fellowship is not there. In, in, the, in, in 1 John, in the book of 1 John, if you read it, 1 John is talking about fellowship, about having fellowship with God. In order to have fellowship with God, you have to first be related to God. But once you're related to God, uh, walking with Him affects your fellowship with Him. And I'm just saying that if you're not careful about your fellowship with God, if you are unconcerned about what you say, how you live, what, what direction you walk, how you act, what your character is, what your nature is. You don't care how you are perceived by others. You say things, you, you boast things, you do things, and you don't care how it reflects on God, then you are not being careful with your fellowship with God. And James says this is really important now. And look at what he says in, in, in this first, in verse 4, first thing he says right off the bat, and, and you'll see it. Let me, let me just read it. It's, it's pretty tough. He said, uh, adulterers and adulteresses. Now, that tells you that, J- that James did not read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. If he did, he didn't get the point of the book, right? <laughs> James said, I mean, James looks at you and James says, all right, if you are not being careful with your fellowship with God, you are an adulterer and adulteress. You adulterers and adulteresses. Holy smoke, I told you. See, most people wouldn't feel comfortable with James. They think they would, but I'm telling you, man, here comes the hammer. Just when you think you get, you can just believe something and sit in a pew, James says, uh-uh, no. It's not about what you believe. It's about the way you act. Because the way you act reflects what you believe. And that's James' word. And notice what he says. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Do you know what enmity really means? It means warfare. In other words, if I'm going to be friends with the world, it's going to put me at war with God. Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo. So he says, I'm an adulterer. Don't you know that friendship with the world puts you at war with God? Whoever therefore wants to be the friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Do you consider yourself an enemy of God? At war with God? Let me tell you something. That's a bad fight. You know why? Because you can't win. That's right. Now, there, there is a good fight. The Apostle Paul identified a good fight. You remember when he said, I have fought, he was talking to Timothy, and he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. The good fight is with the devil. You can whip him. The bad fight is with God. You are not going to beat God. So James says, when you 
are not careful about your fellowship with God, you don't care what you say, you don't care what you do, you don't care where you go, you don't care how it reflects on God at all, and then you are an adulterer or an adulteress. You, you, you have committed sin against God. You have given yourself to the world. You are a friend of the world, which means you're an enemy of God. And he goes on to tell us why. He says, or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who, yearn, who dwells in us yearns jealousy? I know that kind of seems a foreign concept, but let me just say, tell you what that means. That means you say, you say does that mean God is jealous? Because you know, you know, you you know jealous, and you think, okay, I'm not supposed to be jealous. There are two of those similar uh, uh, concepts. One is envy, and one is jealousy. Right? To be envious means I want what you have. I see that you have it, and I want what you have. I am envious of you. To be jealous means I have something, and you are intruding on it, and I want to keep you off of my stuff. So I become jealous when it affects something that belongs to me. I'm envious when it reflects on something that belongs to you. And this verse says that God is jealous. That he looks at us as his property, his possession. Just like, guys, you look at your wife. And ladies, you look at your husband, right? I mean, you look at your wife, guys, as... I mean, she made a commitment, and now she belongs to you, and you made a commitment to her, and you belong to her. So all of this right here belongs to Pastor Tanya. So it's not mine. It's not mine. Uh, Y'all control yourself. Uh, maybe I should have used another example. I know that's a, I know that's a little overwhelming. Uh, Mm. But this belongs to her. And, and, and so if I take this and I give it to somebody else, then I have given away something that does not belong to me. I have given away something that belongs to her. This is why adultery is, and fornication are such horrible, terrible things. This is why they kill relationships and stuff because I have violated the relationship and I've given away what doesn't even belong to me to somebody that I have no right to give away something that doesn't belong to me. And, and the same thing, uh, what, everything I see from her, she's mine. And it means that you know, she can't give it to somebody else because that's mine. And God says, when you make a covenant with me, you belong to me. So when you give yourself to the world, you have now prostituted yourself and given away something that does not belong to you, but belongs to God. And God said, I'm jealous about that. As a matter of fact, in Exodus 34, God said, my name is jealous. Call me jealous. Because I don't like you giving something that belongs to me to, to, to the world. That's that's my property. Don't be giving it away because I'm going to fight against that. I, I can't stand that. I hate that. Uh, that's my property, and you don't violate that. And James says, when you don't care whether God gets the glory, you don't care how it looks, you don't care what you do, what you've just done is you've just given his body, his temple, away to the world you've you, you've given away something that doesn't belong, and God's going to come get you back because that's his property, not yours. Look at what it says in verse 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So God says this to you. If you're one of those that have given yourself to the world and God is jealous for you, humble yourself. Repent. Come back to him. Come off your high horse. Get down there and ask God to forgive you. Get, get, get before God and, and, and repent and ask God to give you the grace and the strength to pull away from, from the world that so attracts you. Ask him to help you, give you strength to do the things that are important for you to do, the things that will bring you close to him. 
I mean, I know you want to go to, you know, some parade. I know you want to go do uh, uh, fun things. I know you want to do rather than look at a Bible or come to a study or be involved with spiritual things. I know it's far more alluring to do that. But when you do that, you prostitute yourself. And James says, you don't, you lose fellowship with God. And you find yourself fighting and warring against God because God's coming to get his stuff back. And so if you want to find favor and grace, God will give more grace. You know what grace is? Grace keeps us from getting what we deserve. No, excuse me. That's mercy. Mercy keeps us from getting what we deserve. Grace gives us what we don't deserve. We don't deserve heaven, but grace gives us heaven even though we don't deserve it when we die. When we die, we ought to go to hell. We're sinners. But because of the grace of God, he doesn't send us to hell. He gives us heaven, which we don't deserve, when we deserve something. The grace of God, but he gives more grace. God resists the proud. You know what the word resist is? It's a military word. It means to, to fight against. It's like a resistance force. You've heard of that before in the military when the enemy's out here and we're back here and we're trying to protect. We send out a force to encounter the enemy and resist them, push them, keep them there. That resistance force fights against the enemy to keep the enemy off of us. Well, that's what that word means. It means God fights against us. God resists us. And who wants to fight God? Not me. Not me. You're losing battle, baby. And I'll talk to you more about that next week when we look at the eight things that, we, that God says to do about this. Really, they're very simple, but they're there, and this is what we do about it. So I know, you know, it's not a very encouraging word. It's a negative way of approaching things and having not and asking not and receiving not. Not, 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 not. You know, that's negative, and you say, I don't like negative. Well, I don't really like it either, but sometimes that's the way God speaks to us. Sometimes that's just the way it is. And so if that describes you in any way, now's the time to turn that around because um, God cares and God has provided and God wants it to be different and he's provided everything for it to be different. I, I tell you, I, you know, I love our church. I love what God's doing here. I think we have many wonderful qualities, many great aspects of our church. Uh, shoot, man, I don't know what anybody would be looking for that, that this church is not. You know, it's, the people are great. The people are wonderful. We don't have cliques and all these other kind of things. But, but, but still, you know, I, my desire is to be everything God wants us to be. That's what my desire is. And I don't have to be a star, and I don't have to be some, you know, bright and morning sun and all of that kind of stuff. I just want to be what he wants me to be. Yeah, yeah. And I want my life to be described by what I am rather than what I'm not, you know. He's a good man. He's faithful. He's, he's peaceful. He's uh, gentle in his nature. He's, he's full of the Holy Spirit. He loves you. He prays for you. I mean, you know, describe me by what I am rather than, you know, man, he doesn't act like a preacher. Boy, I don't, I don't even guess he was a preacher, boy. He, he cusses and rants and raves. He's got a bad attitude. He's bitter and harsh. And don't catch him on a bad day. He'll chew your head off. Yeah. That's, that's what I, yeah, don't cross him. I mean, I, I'm described by what I'm not. You know, I'm not peaceful. I'm not, can you believe he's a Christian? You know, I don't want somebody to be surprised when they found out I'm a Christian. Like, he's a Christian? Well, yeah, that's what James is talking about. All right, Samuel.